So let me just offer for you real quick a, a little bit of a recap of our theme, where we've been so far uh, in our topic of thriving in Babylon. Pastor Phil kicked us off last Sunday morning uh, with the idea and asking the question, how do you think about Babylon in your life? How do you see yourself thriving in Babylon. And I'm not going to rehash the whole thing. We don't have time to get into the, the imagery, this, this idea of, uh, of what the spirit of Babylon is. But all throughout the Bible, we see there is a culture in opposition to God's kingdom. Okay, it's called the spirit of the age. And throughout the Bible, it's often referred to as Babylon. Now, Babylon's a very real place, and uh, the people of Israel were taken captive into Babylon, and God gave his people instruction of how to live, how to survive, and how to thrive while they were in Babylon. But that, that terminology, Babylon, kind of carried on throughout even the New Testament. The uh, New Testament believers used the term Babylon as like a code word to talk about Rome when they didn't want the Romans to know they were talking about themselves. Like God. And today we can ask that question and say, what is, what is the spirit that is opposed to God today that we have to live in, that we have to survive in, that we have to thrive in? How does that work out in our daily lives? So Pastor Phil reminded us last week that when uh, living in Babylon, there's a couple possible uh, interaction, co couple possible choices of how you would carry yourself. One option is to assimilate into Babylon. That's to adopt the cultural values and hope the culture values you as well. Another option is to isolate uh, from the culture around you. Uh, but he calls us, the Bible calls us to not isolate, to not assimilate, but in fact to infiltrate, to infiltrate, to be a presence in it without being contaminated by it. And then this morning we continued in that series, in that thought, specifically asking the question, how do we remain faithful? How do we think about remaining faithful when the government is opposed to God's will in our lives. And, and I just want to, I want to emphasize that as we get to jump into some of these questions now. What we're talking about is how to think about, how to deal with, how to live when the government is opposed to God's will for your life. There's a lot of things that the government is opposed to that you may like, right? There's a lot of things that the government may affirm that you dislike. And they may affirm things you like. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when they are contesting God's will for your life. And there is a distinction uh, there. Uh, so he, he called us to uh, remain faithful. That's God's word to us. Remain faithful to have deep personal convictions, to commit to radical obedience, and in the process trust that God and his providence would carry us through, that we would be like the young men of Israel who were carried into Babylon. So with that as kind of our refresher, little, little recap, uh, we're going to jump into some questions. And I get, I get to ask the questions uh, tonight. Uh, so we'll, we'll, start off, uh, we'll start off with an easy one. How's that sound, Pastor? All right, let's all do right, it. All right, here we go. Um, I work with a group of people who say multiple curse words that include the name of the Lord in vain. I walk away when I hear it, but am convicted that I may not be standing up for God. Pastor shared that we must stand up for Christ and be a light. This came to mind. What should I do different? What are your thoughts? So who wants to jump on that first? What should you do when you hear your coworkers cussing? Is that an opportunity to make a stand? Or is when it Matt starts cussing, I'll tell you what. I... <laughs> Go ahead and answer Matt. Kiss your mother with that mouth. <laughs> yeah, I... I, what, I, what, I, what I hear behind this question is, is the, the very strong appeal we heard today to be a light for Christ. And this person is asking, if I, don't, if, if I don't clearly speak into an ungodly moment, does that equal not being a light for Christ? And I would just want to say, I, I don't think that's what that equals. Um, I, think, I, think we are in, I think we're compelled by Scripture to take every, every opportunity we have. Open doors are open doors, and when a door opens, we should walk through it. I would, I would say that in most instances around your workplace, when you do walk away or when you don't participate, you are turning the light on most often. And so I would just want to commend just, just very um, active, faithful, godly Christian activity there at your work. And 
But if an opportunity pre presents itself, depending upon who it is, maybe it's a fellow employee, maybe it's your boss, we don't know the exact situation, but what I want to hear, what I want to do is take the burden off of your being unfaithful. This is in the category of denying Christ if you don't immediately speak into a situation like this, like this at work. Be the best employee you can be at your workplaces. I always tell our young adults, uh, Christians ought to be uh, runners up for employees of the month everywhere they work because they're so good at their jobs. Okay, um, how, does a, how does a Christian, how do you be a faithful Christian pilot? Land the plane as well as you can. Okay. <laughs> be really good at your job. Speak actively for Christ when you can and let the light shine. Mm. Oh, and, and non-Christians act like non-Christians. You know, so don't, don't, uh, don't expect holiness where there ought not be none until they come to Christ. Mm. You know, I might add, this is my first uh, work experience where I've worked in, a, in an office where they don't cuss. So um, <laughs> it's kind of refreshing uh, having spent 25 years just in the business world. Um, I found that it was more of a marathon than a sprint. And if you try to build relationships with your coworkers, um, you're going to have more credibility with them over time. And you're not going to, kind of like Matt said, you're not going to convert people, their behavior. There's, there'll be something else you'll have to continually fight. Yeah. So I think when you, uh, you build credibility mm. uh, over time. Mm. Excellent. That's great. Excellent. All right. We covered that one. We'll move on to the next one. All right. Uh, why does the church not affirm... LGBTQIA plus rights. Since biblical times, and I'm reading the question as it came in. Since biblical times, society has evolved to see the flaws of other biblical norms, such as slavery, and women have way more rights now than they did then. Why does this not apply to LGBTQIA plus people? In other translations, uh, and this is in quotations, let not man lay with man reads, let not man lay with a boy, speaking to pedophilia, not homosexuality. And uh, I'll just uh, offer in, in explanation, uh, I believe that quote is taken from Leviticus 18.22. Uh, so we, I, I looked through just to make sure we were reading it correctly here. Um, I could not find a uh, reliable biblical translation that translated it in the, the secondary translation that they argued. Um, but as often happens, we understand our Bible was not written in English, right? Especially the Old Testament. Uh, and there is often debate over meanings of words and people use that debate debate to make arguments for their position of choice. And that probably falls on both sides. So who wants to tackle this question? Let me jump in immediately on the translation question. And uh, I mean, I'll, we'll go back to the harder part of the question after that. But the first part of the translation question is, is we should not be surprised that as time goes on, translations come out in line with the culture instead of in line with what the actual words of Scripture are. To my side here, I've brought with me, and I'm not going to open it and read it, but I have a NASB, New American Standard Version of the Bible, which uh, without debate is the most word-for-word -word translation in the English language of uh, the, the biblical text in the original languages. And uh, I assure you that from the front of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's very clear what the translation and meaning is. We only have to go to Romans chapter 1 to find out what God was talking about because in New Testament times, if I were to go there and read it, it says very clearly men lying with men and women lying with women uh, in a sexual way and that it was unequivocally an abomination to God. Only people of a depraved situation would, would affirm and approve such a thing as that. And so that's the first thing. The translation issue really is no issue at all because the culture is going to continually try to push. Think of the TEV in translations. Think of the translations that are gender neutral that have come out and so on like that, which have gone so far as to say that we can't say he referring to God because in line with the culture, we, we're not even sure that God is a he. Well, he's the father of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so it's very clear. Go ahead. So this is where biblical scholarship matters, um, the, the people who study the text and, and determine its, its meaning. Um, so you've spoken to the translation component of this question, but let me just draw the attention to kind of the second idea where uh, we have over time, there, the argument goes that over time we've come to understand things differently than the, the way they did back in biblical times. The uh, 
illustrations used are slavery and women's rights. So why is the Bible, why are Christians not keeping up with the changing times on other issues uh, as well? I'll take a quick uh, try. I say my answer will be probably short, and that's probably okay. Uh, because I believe the Bible calls us to be holy. Yeah. Jesus said, be holy for I'm holy. And so as I read the word, I see things that are holy and things that are holy. And so uh, we don't um, promote the question was, why don't we affirm? Well, the Bible affirms holiness. Mm -hmm. So that would be my answer. Okay. And that holiness applies to anyone of any sexual Absolutely. orientation or... Yeah. On the, on, on, the note of, on the note of why do we, at the end of the question regarding LGBTQ, it said rights. Uh, I, I, I think you're always going to have the conversation about rights for LGBTQ. It's always going to be connected with marriage. That's going to be, that's going to be the right, and that right is uh, the law of the land in our country now. I think it's very important for us as Christians to, uh, to just, add, in addition to what Kirby is saying with holiness, um, any sexual activity or expression of sexuality outside of the design of God given in the Bible is sin, any expression of it. And I think it's very important for us as Christians to remember uh, that when it comes to the rights of LGBTQ people, that is marriage, uh, please remember that an LGBTQ marriage isn't marriage. It's not a marriage. It doesn't matter what and the law of the land is in that case. The, the, the state doesn't own marriage. God owns marriage. This is a sphere issue. There's the family, the state, and the church. State has nothing to do with what defines marriage. It's uh, one author says same -se Christians ought to refer to same-sex marriage as same-sex mirage. Mm. All right. It looks like the real thing, but it's not. Now, as we talk today, we wanted to be empathetic. We understand that this is a an issue in families or a personal issue for you here in this room. The place where we want to put the emphasis as Christian pastors is on the fact that anything that goes against God's good design brings destruction. And so we want to be very clear that we want to lead you away from destruction by telling you by telling you what's true. Amen. So we'll talk to the, we'll look at this word. It says here, since biblical times, society has evolved. And uh, yeah, there's that word, isn't it? That, that word shows up very often. Yeah, we've evolved in many, many ways. In fact, thank Darwin for the word and for the concept because it's crept into every, every, every area of thought and every aspect, Eco economic evolution and educational evolution. Well, here we have societal and spiritual evolution. And uh, the problem with that thought is, is that God's word really hasn't changed. It hasn't evolved at all. God's word does not evolve forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And it's so important for us to understand that. Uh, the question about biblical norms such as slavery and women have way more rights now than they did then. I, I want to point out to you that Christianity itself is the reason that slavery has been fought so hard in all of the world. Uh, you've heard of a man named William Wilberforce. How many of you know who I'm talking about? Well, William Wilberforce in England, even before the United States, he made it his life's purpose and goal to do everything he could to make sure that people knew that they couldn't own other people. The Bible put up with lots of things such as multiple marriage partners in the Old Testament. God, for the hardness of man's heart, put up with a lot of things. Paul, even in the New Testament, dealing with the subject of slavery, talking out, listen, not slavery as we remember in the early days of the United States and its founding, not this kind of abusive, but slavery was more indentured servitude. It was the way to pay off your debt. People were enslaved to one another in order to pay debts off. And even under the Roman Empire, some of the slaves lived much better than some of the freemen because they were often employed by people and they were paid to learn so that they could serve them as lawyers and doctors and many other things. This was slavery under the Roman Empire. Now, but let me just say this. Paul said very clearly, he said, you know, if you can find your way clear to get free of slavery, then do so. But that's not your primary goal. Because in whatsoever state that I find you or the Lord finds you, be content. 
Seek to serve him, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you're a slave or whether you're free, no matter what the situation was. But I will contend that Christianity did more to eliminate slavery as we knew it in the United States more than any place and more than any, any single effort in history. And it was Christianity that brought women to the forefront and gave them any degree of honor, any degree of freedom, any degree of a voice. It was only in Christianity that was found. So the premise of the question, thank you for the question, it really isn't right. Because the rights, now what you mean is this, you mean something a little bit different. The rights of women to not be subservient or to be in subjection or submission to male authority. That's a different question altogether. But we live at a time when it, e, women's rights are equated to being able to not live biblically. Well, it's still biblical for women to live in subjection to their husbands. And we're going to get there in Ephesians. You're not going to like it, but I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> and it's to their own husbands, not every man. Oh, it is so very, very important. So I'm going to contend that slavery has been benefited by the preaching and teaching of the gospel more than any other effort that's ever been in the world to eliminate it. And women have been elevated to a, to a place of appreciation and a place of participation that they never experienced, not even in Judaism. It never happened until Christianity. Great. So um, we're going to jump to uh, this question. It asks... Uh, and this is an opportunity, maybe Pastor Phil, to explain a little bit what you're talking about this morning with your five essential convictions. Uh, yeah. um, the question asks, with all the Bible tells me to do, how do I go about arriving at my five essential convictions? And what is the difference between what the Bible tells me to do and convictions? That is a great question. I appreciate whoever has asked this question. I'll jump in on it and you guys jump in afterwards. But let me, let me just say this. My encouragement this morning was to be, was more self-relevatory. That is, is to ask yourself a question. You know, can I write down some things that are non-negotiable in my life? It's not to say that there are only five. I mean, there could be many more than that. I was just simply saying this morning, hey, let's try this. Let's find out. Let's go home and see, are there five Biblical points, biblical truths, biblical foundations that are not up for debate, that are non-negotiable. In other words, I'm ready to go to the wall with this one. I'm not giving up on this Bible truth. But there are, I'm not saying there's only five. There could be many more. Now, what is the difference between a conviction and what God tells me to do? Well, my first conviction, other than Jesus Christ is Lord... He is my Lord and there is no other Lord. That's my first conviction. My second conviction is, is that as far as I can understand it and I can know what his will is, I will obey all of what he tells me to do. So I'm not saying that the Bible tells us to do a lot of things and there may be hundreds of, I'm telling you that what the Bible tells me to do, here's my conviction, obey what I understand from the scriptures. If God tells me to do it, it's not up for consideration. <laughs> it's just for me to obey it. I don't consider and decide what God tells me to do. I just obey what God tells me to do, and I leave, I leave the results up to him. So biblical convictions, they are those decisions that you make in your life that are non-negotiable based on the word of God. That's a conviction. Go ahead, Kirby. What do you got? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was just enjoying the answer myself. <laughs> uh, what came to my mind was Galatians 5:16. Yeah. Uh, walk in the spirit, and you will not gratify the sinful nature of the flesh, because the flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. It's just like Romans 7, when Paul said, "What I want to do, I don't do; what I don't want to do, I do." And sin dwells in me. So. I agree. As you read the Word of God, and I'm studying through James right now, I mean, one of the first things that said was when you, count, when you uh, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Well, that's, that's, that becomes a conviction for me mm -hmm. because that's how I'm supposed to respond to trials. And so that's just an example. Mm. I read my Word, uh, read God's Word, and I develop my convictions. Along with Galatians, along with Galatians 5.16, I would just add Deuteronomy 29.29, the mm -hmm. secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things that are revealed to us belong to us and to our children. Mm -hmm. And so be a Bible reader. 
uh, read through the Bible, know God's word. Remember that it takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Make that Ooh, your primary activity. That sure is you, excellent. Make sure you read God's word. Did you hear that? that, that that's, that's why we hired Matt. I hired work. this guy because of that. <laughs> it takes the whole Bible to make a... See, write now, that see, down. See, now, now I have to say I got that from somebody. Da, okay. <laughs> write that down. That is a Mattism. if I ever heard one right there. That is, that is really good. Uh, originality is the ability to forget where you heard it that's from. Right. Right? That's right. <laughs> Some, someone once said... <laughs> <laughs> okay. This very pithy statement that yes. everyone will remember. <laughs> That's um, excellent. So moving on, uh, actually, I'm going to take a take a pause real quick just to this is the, your infomercial here for for a moment. Uh, we're about halfway through our Q and A time uh, for this evening. Uh, if you have a question, maybe hearing this whole discussion up here that we're having is sparking some follow up question in your mind. You can ask that question. We still have two more weeks of this that we're going to do. And if you uh, submit your question this evening, we'll get to it next week uh, when, when we're up here. Uh, so the way you do that is by taking your app out on your phone, click the Awesome August tab, and then click the Submit a Question. And it's, it's that simple. And if you're, if you're a low tech person uh, and, and you don't have the digital footprint, you can just write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to one of the nice ladies in our office uh, up front, and they'll make sure it gets into uh, the pile as well. Uh, so... We just finished uh, talking about convictions, mm -hmm. okay, and how that all plays into what are my five essential and all that, uh, and we found out we need the whole Bible. That's, that's, our, that's awesome. our answer. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, that's going to lead into uh, two, these next two questions. I'm going to combine two questions because I think at the core they're asking a very similar question. Uh, since some employers can now mandate what substances can be put into the employees' bodies, i.e. the COVID vaccine, do you think this is wrong? Is it okay for a believer to be against this because of their faith? And why is the government not protecting them from being fired? Similarly, uh, what should the Christian response be regarding mask wearing and mask mandates if they are convicted that masks are physically harmful and or oppressive? So I think I'd actually like to jump in. Well, would you one. do is that? Is that all right? Absolutely. Uh, I've, I've kept quiet so far as much as I could. <laughs> um, and because I actually just got asked this question uh, about, about two weeks ago, someone reached out to me uh, because they're, they're trying to figure this out for themselves and, and how they should respond in their work environment. Uh, and, and what I tried to communicate there was we have to be very careful that we make a distinction between what my uh, legal rights as a citizen of America, as a citizen of the state of Iowa, as a employee at, you know, you fill in the blank, wherever you're working, you have rights that are legal rights, that are legal uh, preferences that, that you are given. Um, but then over here, as a believer, you have biblical rights. You have biblical responsibilities. Mm. Okay, I stole that from someone uh, at, at some point. It was Phil. Um, I think it was. I think it was me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair sure point. Credit's all on the stage. <laughs> so, Pastor so Matt Ag. Pastor yeah. Matt Ag said it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I heard that somewhere. Um, so the point is, we we're very good at blurring that line. Right? We're very good at, at blurring that line and, and, and saying, well, I think it's my right, and, and it's because, because I am a Christian, therefore it's a Christian right. Well, well, maybe not. Maybe it's a right protected by our Constitution. Maybe it's a right protected by your employee contract. But it, you got to be very careful when you make a stand and say, this is what God has said, and therefore I get to. You have to be very careful about making that strong of a stance. Uh, so I'll, I'll just put it out this way, the way it's processed for me. There have been times in my life where because of Paul saying, I need to be all things to all people that I might win some to Christ. Mm. Because Jesus said, <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself, right? Mm. There are absolutely moments where I feel convicted by Scripture that I have to wear a mask, because of the person that I'm interacting with, and I'm trying to fulfill that biblical mandate. And then there are moments where I absolutely cannot wear a mask mm. because it would create a barrier between me and that other person that I'm trying to minister to or work with. So it can't, the mask can't be the biblical issue. There is a deeper issue at play. It's my heart 
It's my sin nature. It's my love uh, that comes from the Spirit of God at work in my life for others. That those are the things that the Bible deals with. Mm. So I would, I would just add that as a caution to you. If you're, if you're facing that, that diff very difficult situation, uh, it, it, just, just be very careful about where you're making your stance and what you're making your stance on, going back to our convictions in mm. Scripture. So anyone else want to? Excellent. I, I, I want to reiterate very, very clearly that when you're talking about convictions, things you're ready to go to the flames for, make sure you're rooted in the scriptures and the biblical commands and you're not going according to your own preferences and your own personal desires and wishes, not even, as uh, Andrew has so aptly pointed out, not even claiming states' rights, rights according to the Constitution, rights as a citizen, claiming those to be Christian rights because that, that's really two different things altogether. And we need to be very, very careful about that. Let me just add here this, that um, as I preached this morning, the name of the sermon was very, very clear. It says, when the government would be God. So I think when we put things on this level and we understand what we're talking about, well, we're talking about taking a stand, bowing the neck, straightening the back, and saying no. We're talking specifically about when the government demands that I do something that is completely and specifically against what God has told me to do or not to do. Shipra and Pua were told, kill the babies. They could not kill the babies in Egypt. They were told to do that. Listen, let me carry it even further. Peter and John were told, preach no more in this name. They could not obey that command. You understand? So we're talking about the, we're talking about when the government would be God, when they put their authority and their word over the specific and clear commands of God. That is very, very, and when they try to take its place, take, take God's place. So that is the subject matter. It, I, I, I went to the most obvious passage in the Bible on this subject. Here's my image, bow down and worship it because it represents me. Well, as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there can never come a point where you acquiesce and you bow to worship another God. Have you ever heard of commandment number one? So see, there's, there's times when Christians cannot bow, but they may burn. Very important for us to understand that. All right. All right. We'll move on to uh, the next question. Should the church ever close its doors because of a pandemic or any other government mandate? I feel, like, I feel like I'm burning with all these questions. I know. It's a little warm up here. Though. <laughs> hey, Brother Matt, I need to confess something to you. I drank out of that bottle, and I drank out of that <laughs> bottle. Oh. Well, then. Can I offer I mean, an since olive branch? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was for that great quote you had. <laughs> That's it, man. <laughs> I might, I might just step in on this one. I think maybe what they're saying uh, is, is there a time when the, when the church should close its doors because the government has said you can no longer preach the gospel? I mean, if there was a national disaster, if we had a typhoon coming, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud things along that line, then we probably would close the doors. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, but I think, the, I think the flavor of the question is, is there a time when the government can tell you stop preaching uh, sermons that say when, gov when government would be God, yeah. Um, then I believe the answer would be no. You know, we're called to preach the gospel, and and we'll be here until I guess the building is gone, mm -hmm. and then we'll just be under the outside. <laughs> mm -hmm. So hey, I guess man. the answer is no. We would never close our doors. Which uh, is, and, and the great thing is, we have a model for that already for some of our brothers and sisters around the world. That's right. Who are already who are already in contexts like that. We're building like this is just unthinkable. 
because it's just too public and it's just it's just too it's just it's just too visible. I'm 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 remembering that Paul told Timothy he anticipated this because he, he tells Timothy to be ready to preach in season and out of season. Mm -hmm. and he doesn't mean like you know be ready to preach when it's fall and summer. <laughs> he means to be ready to preach when it's uh, when it's when it's popular and when it's not popular. Uh, whatever the, whatever the season of the day is, you need to be, you need to be ready to ready to preach. And um, I, I think the principle that just needs to guide us as Christians is if God if God commands it, we have to do it. Mm. If he commands it, and if he forbids it, we can't do it. Mm. And I think if we have those two guiding principles, we'll be, we'll be very faithful. I mean, the way, the way I consistently, I, I was sitting there listening, listening, listening to Pastor preach today and thought, the, the speed at which the culture has moved in regards to its militancy against the church, a church like ours, is almost analogous to the way technology has changed. It has been so fast. I mean, if you guys sense this, it has been, so, it's like the snap of a finger. I mean, I remember, it's just, since I was in high school, things were relatively, relativism was a big thing. You believe what you believe, and I believe what I want to believe. If you go on social media, cancel culture is not relativistic. No. Cancel culture is legalistic. You confirm to the standard, or we're going to, that's not, that's not, that, that has changed in a decade. It's incredible to me. And so I was just listening to that thinking, um, we, we, uh, the, this is a sermon to equip the saints to be prepared for suffering. And so I think one of the, one of the best things we can do as pastors today is, is, to, is to prepare you to suffer. Um, and to, and which, it, which, is, which the Bible tells us to do. Peter says, prepare yourself for suffering. Peter says, uh, don't be surprised. Yeah, a surprise is something you didn't expect. Right? And so we need, to, we, need to expect, we need to expect suffering. But I'm astounded at how quickly, and I've had conversations with many of you about, it has, just, it has been the turn of a page over a couple of years, and we have landed ourselves in a different scenario. And um, I think it's really time for us to remember that Christianity does very well in hard times. Amen. It does very well in hard times. This is an all-weather faith. Um, the center of it is a man who was killed. Mm. And so we, we win that way. When you see when you see when you see Canadian pastors thrown in prison, just 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 in your head say what that Canadian pastor ought to do is go around the corner and obey Jesus and throw a little party, because Jesus said, "Rejoice when this happens to you, mm. rejoice when you suffer for my name's sake." Um, the disciples in Acts four are are thrilled that they are considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. But friends, the question is, are we worthy of our sufferings? Mm. Because it's um, because it's because it's here, and so I'm just grateful for a sermon that equips us to think that way. You know, I I, I referred to it, and you know, the time gets away, and and I didn't say it this morning, but let me read you. Uh, Peter so clearly tells us the situation that we're in. He's speaking to those uh, those Christians and Jews, uh, those true converts that have been scattered. What we call them, the diaspora, and uh, they they were scattered all over because of their faith. They were running for their lives, so to speak. Here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. This is so important. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit and glory of God rests on you you. I find it very prescient that he says, look at this. He says, do not think it strange. Do you know what's strange? 250 years of total religious freedom. That is strange. What's not strange is, is that we would be persecuted for righteousness sake. This is what Peter declares so clearly. First Peter chapter four, verse 12. Okay, we've got about two minutes left. Two minutes. Okay, so this is a, a rapid fire question, okay, that I'd, I'd like a response from each of you on here. Uh, what are some things now that you see very clearly we shouldn't bow to that we already are? Doesn't have to be COVID related things. In fact, I would prefer suggestions of other things. Thoughts. <laughs> and we'll start uh, with you, Kirby. If you could just give us, you know, rapid fire. Yep. Uh, when you're a, an accountant type, things are black and white. So um, there's not a lot of plaid in my life. So uh, the first uh, the first answer that comes to my mind is the things that we should. What was, what was the way they termed it? What we should be. What things we now are approving of or right, allowing? Yeah. Oh yeah. So what comes to my mind is basically sin. 
Uh, what am I doing? What am I involved in? What am I looking at? What am I, what am I saying? What am I thinking? Uh, what am I allowing to influence my life? Those are the things. Mm. You know, uh, we, we, tend, we tend to, when we come to questions like this and we come to these situations, we tend to look around and look out, you know, and say what's going on and we're not fighting it or what's happening and we're not standing up and those kind of things. But the truth is, is the best way to get a congregation full of people who are standing strong is when we have individuals who are standing strong and Kirby's nailed it. The best place to stand strong is to stand strong against sin in your own life. It's to face the facts. Am I envious? Am I jealous? Am I hateful? Am I unkind? Do I demonstrate the love of God in my life? Do I pray? I mean, I have to look at myself. The best way to have a strong congregation is to have a bunch of individual Christians who face the facts, look in the mirror and say, boy, Kirby, you nailed it. You know, what do we approve of? We give everybody else a hard time and we give ourselves a pass many times on bad things in our life. Boy, God's called us to be holy. Kirby said it a minute ago. Boy, be ye holy, for I am holy, the Lord says. Boy, we ought to just stop and think. Man, what am I approving of and doing that is just not okay? Amen. I, I, I guess I could just, just keep it on the personal note and say don't, uh, don't bow to the, cultural idea, the, the culture's idea that, you're, that your faith is private. Uh, yeah. don't, don't bow to that. I think, I think that we've been, we've been sold that for a long time. Uh, the, 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 the problem with saying our faith is private is there, there's just nothing. Uh, Christianity is personal, but it's never private. That's right. Um, you, you trust in Christ personally. You affirm, you affirm your doctrines personally. All of that is personal, but it cannot, it cannot be private. So I think I would, I would, just, I would just amen what Kirby and Phil shared. Mm. And um, I think that's I, idols. Are, every idol in my life should be like Dagon in the temple and be face down crumbled. Mm -hmm. That's what every idol should be in my life. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's just, it's full stop, mm -hmm. destroy it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, you know, some, some idols just need to be destroyed outright. And then some idols, I have to learn to live with them, like the idol of money. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I can't just get money out of my life. I have to learn how to deal with it in a godly way. Well, that's, that's, this is all Christian living. Mm -hmm. And so I think we want to just keep it personal and let the gospel work its way out and push itself into the corners. Last yeah. word. From me. You can say anything you oh, no, want you to after ahead. this. You got, you got the last word. Last word is, don't you think pride is a big problem? You know what God hates? He hates seven things and two of them are pride. Pride. Even religious pride. Wow. Um, so, there you go. Your questions have been answered uh, for this evening. We'd like to remind you, if, if this stirred up another question in your mind, feel free to submit it, and we'll get to it next week. Um, we are going to take a moment just to pray, and uh, then we will head on outside uh, for all the, the stuff. Yeah, Kirby. Can I say something just real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but I, today was a heavy subject. Yeah. Um, if you think it was a heavy subject, just raise your hand. And I'm not trying to talk you into it, but uh, it, was, it was like a wake-up call, I think, for us. And so I was just thinking of Isaiah uh, out of chapter 41. If I could just read a couple verses here, beginning with verse 10. So I think we need to be encouraged. I think mm, we need amen. to walk away from here, not as though, uh, wow, you know, this is really bad news and we lost and it's all over with. But uh, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Amen. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then verse 13, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, for I myself will help you, Amen. declares the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just, uh, I thank you for your word, the foundation that it provides for our lives the wisdom that it provides for us, the encouragement, the conviction, uh, the truth that it brings for us. God, I ask that you would not let us grow weary in doing good, but allow us to stay faithful and pursue you in all that we say and do and think, that we would treat others the way you have treated us, with grace, with love. 
Let us be the lights that shine in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. For your honor and your glory. And thank you that we can come together for this time. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the fellowship and the fun we're about to have. We love you and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.